Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the last of our 2024 geriatric competency series that the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative um, for Josephine and Jackson counties that we put on every year. Uh, today we are um, having Morgan Marler and uh, Shannon and we are addressing social isolation, loneliness, and connection, uh, promising strategies for older adults in rural communities. So to get started, I just want to uh, have some training etiquette. So we ask you to mute your mic, uh, to utilize the chat for questions and comments. You will receive a follow-up email with the slides, a link to the recording, and also any other materials uh, that our presenters would like you to have. And you will receive uh, an extra email from Portland State University who does our evaluations. So you'll see at the bottom, um, IOA evaluation is the address that that will be coming from. So that is a, for a certificate of attendance and uh, just to let us know how we're doing. Uh, you need to have live attendance to receive CEUs for today's training. And let's see what else. So uh, the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative uh, started in 2015. We started to um, specifically address depression in older adults. And now we are doing a lot more um, than than that. So we work to provide a better access to care from qualified providers. Um, for behavioral health and wellness services. Uh, we have 24 specialists across the state. We have a number with us today um, on the, the call, and we do collaboration and coordination within systems of care within each of our counties. We build uh, knowledge capacity through workforce development trainings and community education. And we also provide complex care consultations, which is uh, a service that is free, that we help people um, understand how to maybe better support um, older adults, but then also uh, some of the unique older adult considerations um, as well. Okay, um, I'm gonna hand it over to our presenter and let her get going. And like uh, Angela Jensen said, we have lots of space today, so feel a welcome to uh, ask a lot of questions, and we want this to be something that is very much interactive. I will stop sharing. There you go. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. Um, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Morgan Marler, and I serve as the Associate Director for Network and Partnerships at the Foundation for Social Connection. I'm actually um, joining you from the West Coast today. I spend um, most of my time in Washington, D.C., where I live with my partner and our dog, um, but I'm from Seattle, Washington originally, and this morning I was in actually in your great state of Oregon. Um, I flew out of Portland to Seattle this morning, um, which is a very quick flight. Um, I think I was in air for maybe 15 minutes, um, but just love that I was in your state, had my feet on the ground, and now I get to spend time with all of you, which is very exciting. Um, today, I am going to be sharing um, a little bit about the organization that I am here representing, but also some of the work that we do. Um, we love an interactive chat box, but we also encourage, because this is a little bit of a smaller group today, for people to come off of mute. I'm going to have multiple um, opportunities for you all to ask questions, but also to engage in conversation and dialogue with one another. Um, Angela and Angela were sharing a little bit about who is in the room today based on the registration, and I'm just really excited to hear from you all um, about your experience and kind of your reactions and your takeaways from this presentation. Um, Cause we believe at the foundation, the more diversity of perspective and sector that is at the table in this work, the stronger that it is. So really excited to be with all of you today. So at the foundation, um, we start all of our meetings with a moment of connection. Um, so I'm going to give you all just a moment to take a look at the question on your screen. Um, and then we'll ask you to either 
drop um, your answer in the chat, or if you feel so called, the spirit is moving you this morning, go ahead and come off of mute and share um, with us. So the question is, um, what is a recent meaningful connection you've experienced or what plans do you have to connect looking forward? Um, so I will share first just to model. So one um, meaningful moment of connection that I had recently was actually, and I shared this with Angela and the team um, before you all joined, I am on what I call my West Coast baby tour. Um, and that is really getting to see all of my best girlfriends who are now moms, welcoming either their first or second children um, into the world. And I get to now spend time with them and the next generation. Um, and just after everything that's been going on in the world, spending time with little ones was really, really meaningful. And I think that like my best friend's daughter is now my best friend. She's three, but that just spending time with her was so fantastic. Um, and then I actually get to spend time with my family in Seattle, um, this weekend. So I have connections on both sides of this trip. Um, I am going to take a look at the chat box to see what we have. Um, yeah. And if you feel so called, like, please come off of mute and, and share. Hi, my name is Cassie. I'm the director of Community Volunteer Network. Uh, Hi, you. Good morning. Our, our mission is to provide meaningful volunteer opportunities for older adults. Um, so every day I get to feel connection, which is such a blessing. Um, we just recently expanded services to Josephine and, and Douglas County, and we were looking for a very last minute, like the day before open enrollment started in Medicare season for some office space. And it was just absolutely incredible to tap into network that exists here in Southern Oregon. Um, very, very fast. RV Cog responded. They've donated a touchdown office in their building for us. Thanks to connection from previous coworkers that have lived in nonprofit land for a while. Um, they, you know, set up tables and chairs and gave us free Wi-Fi and and we're just really able to launch this program like literally within a day um, in Josephine and Douglas County. So those those connections, those those people that you work with, that then you keep relationships with, um, and then in the long run, comfort come through for you in the end is is really cool. Amazing. I have this like visual of like an old fashioned like barn raising, but like the modern day version of that with like technology and like office space and your community really coming to the table for you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm going to read a couple in the chat. And if these are yours and you want to come off of mute and give some more color to them, please feel free. Um, Tanya, it looks like you attended your niece's birthday party. Um, and then you're also going to be spending some time with family this weekend, which sounds so great. Um, Michelle Peterson, connecting with my close friends right now, two of whom are struggling with life events. It has been really meaningful to be able to provide them support and deepen our relationship. So just like really being able to hold space for those that you care about. Thank you so much. And Christina, I moved back recently and I'm looking forward to spending more time with family. We always have Sunday dinners and I get to be a part of them again. That's so sweet. Um, thank you all for sharing. Please feel free to keep popping, popping moments of connection in the chat. Um, we were just having a conversation before uh, we got started today about just how important that human to human interaction is and how it's really just kind of the basis of so much of our work. Um, and just excited to keep keep seeing what you all have to to contribute. So for today's conversation, um, I'm going to just kind of walk us through the agenda and what you can expect over the next about hour and 30 minutes. Um, so first, I'll talk a little bit about the foundation and the work that we do. I'll also provide an overview of social isolation, loneliness, and connection, or as we sometimes abbreviate it, SILK. Um, so that'll be definitions, trends, effects, and some other information that's really important to kind of set the stage. Um, then we'll dive into the research framework that guides all of our work, which will be called the social framework, as well as the interactive tools we've created for communities, like the action guide for building socially connected communities, which we launched a year ago. 
um, that we just had our one year anniversary of, um, and we had a webinar for that featuring a couple of the communities that are actually using it in practice. Um, and each of the resources that we put forth, um, whether that's a promising or evidence-based strategy really is steeped in research. And we wanna make sure that we're translating research into practice. We'll include some examples of communities that are putting some of these strategies into action and kind of what the results have been so that you maybe kind of can see yourself in this work. And then lastly, we'll kind of explore where to go from here. I did mention there's going to be some interactive moments. So I know that it is a, a gloomy Thursday over here in the on the West Coast. Um, so please feel free to drink your beverages and come off of mute um, whenever you feel so called. Um, and I really appreciate Cassie for modeling coming off coming off of mute for us. So would love to hear other voices in this space as we continue. Okay, so a little bit about the Foundation for Social Connection. So um, Foundation was founded um, in 2020. We're based in Washington, D.C., but we're really focused nationally um, in different sectors, but also across the lifespan. So we'll be talking about older adults today, um, but we also do work across the lifespan, as I said, with younger adults, anyone in between. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, um, and we have a sister organization that I'll just mention very quickly that's a 501c4, which is more of an advocacy organization, and that was founded in 2018. So we've been doing this work since before the pandemic and really kind of before social isolation and loneliness was really at the forefront of, I would say, like a lot of Americans' minds. Um, and then through the pandemic, I think we all experienced isolation and loneliness at some degree and some for others that like, it was very acute. Um, and so now we have this very visceral experience of knowing what it's like and then also seeing the effects in the work that we're doing. So as an organization, we're really leading um, the work in, of advancing social connection, social connection nationwide rooted in evidence for our collective well-being. Our work is really about translating research into practice and creating long lasting partnerships and convening opportunities for field builders such as yourself and prioritizing social connection as a national value powered by lived experience. So we work closely with our scientific leadership council, which is made up of 13 of our of the leading experts on social isolation and loneliness in the United States. And then we also have a larger scientific network to make sure that we're really bringing evidence into strategies and policies for greater connection. We also work with local leaders from across the country, ranging from local leaders all the way up to the national level. Um, to really help develop and implement best practices tailored to communities and population specific needs. Um, and we're really working to build a vibrant society where social connection is really at the heart of how we live. So some terms and definitions. I think it's important um, to kind of separate social isolation from loneliness and really understand how they are distinct and then how they um, kind of play into one another. So to start to define them, um, so it's important for developing interventions also so we can understand what we are intervening on and to make sure that we're addressing and improving the correct issue. So I'll start with social isolation. It's really the objective measure that count, it's the count of infrequent interactions with others, infrequent engagement in, in different social groups. So really you can think about your social network. Does it look bare? Does it look full? Um, how many people are you really kind of interacting with on a given day or in a given week? Um, an example might be an older adult or potentially someone with a disability who's homebound or might not be able to leave their home and not able and to engage in supports. It could also be someone in rural America um, who, you know, whether it's because of like not having access to broadband or other types of access to social infrastructure doesn't have the same connectivity that say be someone in a more urban context might have. And really it's about the, the historical disinvestment in um, social infrastructure. So we're not seeing as many clubs, groups, associations, or third places for people to really come together and engage. If you're familiar with Dr. Robert Putnam's work um, that came out in the 90s, Bowling Alone, you'll know that from the 60s to now, we've seen major declines in the amount of time that we're really spending in community with one another. 
Um, and then we can think about loneliness and that's really the subjective measure. So the, that's the discrepancy between the relationships that we do have and those that we wish to have. So you can think about kind of walking into a party and maybe knowing a lot of people in it, um, but really experiencing kind of loneliness. So you're not isolated, you're in community with other people, but there's a gap between what your the desired connection you have is and then what you what you're getting. Um, and I think that all of us have experienced that at some point in our life, whether we're the new kid at school or the new person at a specific job, or maybe stepping back into our family of origin. Um, and I think there's a couple of populations that we kind of want to lift up as examples here. So you could think about a young, um, a young adult who might identify as LGBTQ plus in school and really doesn't feel like they can be themselves in that place of learning. Maybe there aren't other people or adults in that space that have a shared identity with them. You could also think of a new parent who has their friend group, but they may not be able to understand what they're experiencing. So we're currently experiencing a crisis of disconnection. So 58% of Americans report experiencing loneliness. And the U.S. Census Bureau found that in most households, um, there is at least one person that's experiencing loneliness. Um, and I, we kind of included some, some statistics specifically for Alaska, Oregon, and Virginia, just to kind of give you a sense of the, the, the range here. So 58% nationally in Alaska, that's about 40, 45.9% in Oregon, 44.7, Virginia, 43.3. And you can see on the map, the places that are a little bit darker in color, that's where there's the higher rates of loneliness reported. And that's from a U.S. Census Bureau. Um, and then the places that are lighter are a lower amount. But you kind of can see that there's not a there's not a huge range or huge discrepancy in experience. Um, so it's important to know that in 2023, one in three adults aged 50 to 80 reported feeling isolated from others. Over 70% of adults aged 50 to 80 with poor or fair mental health, and 55% with poor or fair physical health reported feelings of isolation and loneliness. And I think you know it's while we're having conversations about older adults today, it's also important to think about Gen Z. So we actually know that Gen Z is actually the loneliest generation. Um, and we a recent study from Cigna actually identified that 79% of Gen Z um, are experiencing loneliness. And so it's kind of Gen Z and older adults that are experiencing this at the highest rates. And Angela put a great question in the chat. We identify Gen Z as 18 to 30 year olds. Um, it could also be 18 to 27 year olds, but we're, in, we're talking about the cohort that's like 18 to 30 right now. Um, so while we're focused on talking about older adults and those living in rural areas today, there's also other groups that are at risk that are really worth highlighting. And these individuals can hold multiple identities and have additional experiences that compound their risk. So we could also have an older adult that's living in a rural context, right? And that actually increases their risk of experiencing isolation or loneliness or potentially both. And it's essential that we understand the nuances and ex of experiences of social isolation and loneliness and really develop solutions that target the needs of the population, as well as the experience of either isolation, loneliness, or both. So disconnection is really caused by policy systems and structural barriers. So examples of this could be housing, house zoning, lack of access to internet, transportation, um, but the decline can also be attributed to some cultural reasons. And some I'd like to highlight are hyper-individualism. So that's really the belief that people need to be living independently to be successful in life. And this can cause people to undervalue family, friendship, and community life, and really to not see that these relationships are part of a healthy, flourishing life. We also have seen just rates of mobility increase drastically over the last 20 years. And so our culture can often value the ease of movement from one location to another as a way of to succeed materially or pursue individual goals. And for older adults and rural Americans, this can mean that friends and family move to more urban areas for work or suburban areas to raise families, thereby reducing the number of interactions and level of social support that these older adults and rural people have. 
Um, and then we also are seeing, um, I think all of us might have be familiar with like food deserts. So areas where there's not grocery stores, we're now seeing trends of actual civil society deserts. So those are, you know, third places and social clubs are really important and sources of connection to for potential friends, spouses, and broader community. In many places, these third spaces are and social clubs have been privatized. So you can think about private gyms, private social clubs, and often they're so expensive that only the highest earners can really afford them. But there's also um, can be issues for rural communities and older adults that their communities have fewer or inaccessible public gathering spaces. And then I think another really important one um, as we talk about older adults and those living in a rural context is valuing youth over aging. So as a culture, we can sometimes value youth and innovation and vitality in a way that undervalues the age, tradition, and wisdom of our elders. And if aging and death becomes things we need to hide, we can sometimes isolate those the, isolate those that are aging or dying from the rest of our community, increasing the loneliness that our elders actually are experiencing. So in 2023, the Surgeon General of the United States put out an advisory on the healing effects of social connection. And in his advisory, he highlights national trends in social connection and how the time we spend in different kinds of social interaction has actually decreased significantly over the years. So on your screen, you're, you see uh, kind of a sample of the graphs from that report or from that advisory. And so I'll just read a couple of them um, to kind of highlight um, what he was looking at. So um, from 2003 to 2020, um, the time spent engaging with friends actually decreased 20 hours per month. And that also is across, you know, household family engagement. So that was a decrease of about five hours a month. Time spent in companionship, meaning with friends, and that decreased 14 hours per month. Our social engagement with others. And then you see this kind of increase of social isolation. So an increase of time spent alone over 24 hours per month. So we're spending innately more time by ourselves and less time in community with others, whether that's household, friends, or people outside of our household. Thanks for dropping that in the chat. So I just talked at you for about 10 minutes um, and I'd love to kind of invite us back into conversation with one another. So I'm, I'm curious what factors may be contributing to social isolation and loneliness in Oregon or with the populations that you're specifically working with. And feel free to drop that in the chat or come off of mute. Um, this is also a time, if you have any questions about some of the statistics that I that I presented or the information, we're, I'm happy to also answer questions about what I've covered so far. I put one in there, the lack of transportation is big because um, our older adults that are Medicaid still, so under 65, they have transportation for medical reasons, but they don't necessarily have transportation for social engagement reasons. And then a lot of our older adults over 65 have absolutely no transportation <laughs> accessible, you know, um, especially in our the rural, rural areas. Yeah. And we also, there's a, there was a study done, um, trying to remember the name of it and the, the person that did it, but essentially there's a, there's a correlation between lack of transportation and ER visits. So there, you were actually seeing older adults in across contexts actually going into the ER as potentially a way to actually access social connection and get transportation rather than you know, act really being in dire need of like going to the ER, right? So your point about like transportation for medical purposes, but not for like the other things that really create wellness for someone. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to say this, Regina, um, dreary winter weather. Yeah, that can definitely be a contributing factor. Lack of meeting spaces, social anxiety, lack of transportation, disabilities keeping them home, very rural areas, and lack of internet. Yeah. Fear due to living in an unsafe area that prevents them from leaving home. 
Cassie, um, again, we run lots of volunteer programs. So, you know, it's getting the message. It, we're always preaching to the choir. It's trying to get the message about what the opportunities and benefits of volunteering can be to those folks that are um, are isolated and, and, you know, kind of stuck in that spot. So um, it, it's hard to communicate sometimes with um, showing them the, the, the value that they could get. And then for those few folks that we do get in touch with, um, you really have to make them feel like they belong really fast, that they have value to add because um, they certainly do, but you have to kind of teach them that they do again because they've been, maybe they retired 10 years ago and, um, and feel like they've lost so much of their skill set or their value because they tied so much of their value to work. And now in retirement, um, they, they lose that sense of self. Um, so. Thank you, Cassie. Yeah, you're just, um, there's a partner of ours that's in Missouri that works at um, United Way of the Ozarks. His name is Greg, um, Greg Morris, I think is his last name. But he, um, he's actually like retired, I think three times. He's like one of those people that can't stay retired. And he just created, um, launched a program about two years ago called Give Five. And it's all about how to engage. It's essentially an older adult volunteer program and taking retirees um, and giving them, pairing them with organizations that have higher level volunteer opportunities, meaning they're actually tapping into their professional knowledge and I think overall they've created a million dollars worth of like service hours for all these local nonprofits on a yearly basis. So it's this huge, it's really good for the older adults and the retirees. It's also really good for the community and just like, it's a total win-win all around. Um, and they're starting to look at kind of like the impact on like the physical well-being as well as the emotional well-being of the volunteers but I think you're right, like communicating the like, so what, and like getting people through the door is almost like 90% of the work. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. Oh, and I love that. We don't like to say don't retire, rewire. Yeah. So good. Michelle, I'm going to read yours. Actually, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to come off of mute and just vocalize into this space what you put in the chat. Oh, absolutely. Um, I feel like the economy plays a huge part as well. Um, a lot of people are living on smaller incomes, especially the retired community, and they can't afford to go out or they can't afford to have a car or, you know, the the things that we like to do just to go out to dinner occasionally with friends or things like that become a lot harder to do. And there's a, like I put in the chat, there's a, a larger disconnect in society as well. I feel like people aren't engaging each other. You, you just go to the grocery store and say hello to people. It feels like everybody has their, their blinders up. And so you're not engaging those people that may be feeling isolated, you know, just a friendly hi or a smile when you're passing. And that just encourages that feeling of isolation when you don't have those little interactions with each other. It just, um, I don't know, it's, it's really depressing. And I can understand why a lot of people feel isolated because there's not that, that sense of community that I've noticed, um, is definitely declining and a lot of Oregon has a lot of rural communities we are we're very isolated as far as different towns especially if you don't have transportation and a lot of our uh, gathering places have closed I know even just on our coast you know we used to have a bowling alley we used to have you know fun places for people just to go and hang out and those have those have all closed down so it it makes it a lot harder to actually find places to engage and have conversations with people yeah thank you
I'm going to go ahead um, and just move us along. Um, so this slide is really about the impact of isolation and loneliness. So research shows serious detrimental consequences to our health and well-being. Our physical, mental, and cognitive health can be infect affected. And chronic isolation and loneliness actually increases our risk of heart disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, anxiety, depression, diabetes, and other health um, conditions. And also loneliness can increase our risk for premature death by 26%. Um, but there's also an economic cost. So these high rates of disconnection cost employers about $406 billion due to absenteeism and lower productivity. And it also costs Medicare nearly $7 billion each year. So there's a huge kind of um, monetary rationale for why we should be addressing this. I know I'm hearing, from, um, I'm seeing in the chat and hearing from folks that like, we know this is an innately human um, issue that we need to be in community with one another. And there's also these macro impacts that are, that are also kind of being caused. Um, so I think it's just important to kind of continue to hold that there are kind of short-term impacts, but there's also longer-term impacts on the longevity and well-being physically and mentally and emotionally on the individual. So isolation and loneliness are also associated with elder abuse and scamming. So social isolation and mental impairment, such as dementia and Alzheimer's, can make older adults more vulnerable to abuse. And social isolation can also be a form of abuse, of abuse in and of itself. So social interactions and relationships are key to emotional health. And when a caregiver or a long-term care facility staff member or other abuser isolates an older adult, this becomes a form of, old, of elder abuse. And research has also found that older adults who report lower scores on well-being measures are less socially supported and have lower levels of health, finances, and total literacy. Um, we're actually more susceptible to scams. All right, another opportunity for discussion. Um, so I would just love to know, are there any additional impacts you see on older adults or rural Americans? Um, and I'm gonna go back to the slide of impacts just so we can take a look at that. So curious um, in your context, what are the other impacts that you're seeing or that you're hearing about for older adults or rural Americans? Wow, Kathy. Other impacts or any of these that really like stand out to you? Community Volunteer Network runs the SHIBA program, Senior Health Insurance Benefits Assistance. And as part of that, we're also part of the Senior Medicare Patrol. So um, our volunteer counselors are trained to help people identify, we, we, we teach preventative lessons on how to basically monitor their Medicare EODs to make sure that they're not being scammed by a medical billing situation. Um, and we identify a lot of those each year, um, procedures that were not done, medical durable equipment that's being billed to somebody, um, somebody's Medicare number that, you know, isn't theirs. Um, and then they get sent so much junk mail during open enrollment for the Medicare season um, that it, it it's a real problem. It's very confusing. It's already a confusing, stressful time. Um, and then all the stuff that they receive um, is hard. So the, the Senior Medicare Patrol volunteers that help out with that are huge. And if you didn't know about that resource, know that it's out there. You can call the SHIBA line to help with that. Yeah. Um, for our friends that maybe aren't familiar with that, Casey, uh, Cassie, sorry, um, if you don't mind dropping a, a link in the chat if you're able, and if not, I will follow up with a link just if, if someone else is curious about engaging that resource. Okay. Thank you. Any other um, impacts that are maybe different or that you have kind of personal experience with that you're seeing on the on the screen? Well, I'll just stay. So I'm a suicide prevention coordinator and a, a postvention response for our county. And um, I definitely see a link 
um, to suicidality and depression when it comes to social isolation. Um, yeah, a very big direct uh, connection. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, we um, we have a youth focused organization that we work really closely with called Only Seven Seconds. And um, it's it was named because um, someone timed themselves of like how long it takes to like take your phone out and text someone that you're thinking about them. And so I think it's important to also like we're we're going to give examples of a kind of like large scale interventions, but it's also just really important to think about how we are think just expressing ourselves to the people that are in our networks that we're you you know we're thinking about you you matter to us and that only takes 7 seconds. Um Angela in the chat said older adults not being able to get procedures done because they don't have anyone who can provide them aftercare at home for them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of procedures that you have to be able to attest that you have somebody that will stay with you at night for the next 72 hours. Not happening for a lot of folks. Yeah. And I imagine that that also then plays into like other physical health risks, right? Especially if they don't. Absolutely. Yeah. You're so, talking about cataract surgery and somebody tripping because they can't see. And just, yeah, that spiral effect. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, so on that kind of sadder note, I'm going to move us into on to a more positive note. So social connection provides really clear benefits to our health and our well-being. We talk about it at the foundation as actually a pro protective measure. So in, to, in addition to being a remedy and a pre preventative measure to those health effects I mentioned earlier, social connection can also make our society safer, more inclusive, prosperous, resilient, and civilly engaged. Um, so I think it's, I'll just share a couple of statistics, um, specifically about like resilient communities. So when communities are connected, they're actually more likely to be prepared for and recover from emergencies and unexpected crises. Communities with stronger social networks and higher levels of social capital are also more equipped to handle natural disasters and coordinate emergency response plans. And they also have higher rates of social capital. Um, higher rates of social capital has led to lower incidences of COVID and COVID-19 related deaths. And then as far as like safety is concerned, um, connected communities actually have lower rates of crime and violence and greater connection also helps community members feel safer and more likely to collectively take action to prevent crime. I saw someone in the chat say that, you know, someone that they know, an older adult they work with actually doesn't feel safe leaving their home because of things that are happening in their neighborhood. So more socially connected communities could actually help enable kind of that barrier for an older adult leaving their house kind of go away or dissipate. Um, and then research has shown that fostering individual sense of community can actually improve their relationships with local government um, and the trust between an individual and an institution. And people who lack trust are, are more likely to distrust public institutions and government and believe that they act independent, acting independently is actually a better way to do things than working together. So you can kind of see um, social disconnection is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then social connection actually enables a lot more social connection, civil engagement, and kind of this like blossoming of society. So to further the awareness of this issue, um, collaboration on solutions and support for this work, we've been releasing research reports using our social framework, which is really our theory of change. Um, and we've also been developing and piloting our action guide, which we kind of qualify as a tool. So our social framework um, serves as a roadmap for exploring how social isolation, loneliness, and connection affect us in each sector of society and at every level of influence and across our lifespan. From this, we can effectively understand and systematically identify promising strategies and policies to implement and future um, gaps we need to further explore. I should say, identify future gaps we need to explore. Our most recent report have focused on the built environment, 
um, which includes housing, transportation, and the environment, and how intentionally creating human-centered spaces can actually create more socially connected society. We've also reached, uh, released reports on health, education, and labor, and we're currently working on an arts and culture report. And we'll be um, re hopefully releasing that um, in the new year. And then our action guide for building socially connected communities, which you see on the right-hand side of your screen, um, we released about a year ago. And that was developed through extensive conversations with local leaders and in-depth research. And it's really meant to equip um, local leaders with evidence-based strategies, resources, and data to collaboratively implement sustainable, scalable initiatives. So, so far we're piloting um, in about five communities across the country. Um, I mentioned Little Rock, Arkansas, West Sacramento, California, um, uh, two communities in kind of more rural context, one in Cowley County, Kansas, and one in Michigan, and then actually a neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. There's also probably a dozen other communities utilizing the action guide that's not working necessarily as close to us. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and highlight a couple of strategies that come from both our um, social framework reports as well as our action guide. So some of the promising strategies that I think would be of interest to, to the folks on this call. So um, we talk about intergenerational communities. So sometimes these are called age-friendly communities and their benefits are really to help reduce loneliness and strengthen empathy, foster social support and build social cohesion for all ages by creating opportunities for meaningful social interaction and bridging differences across generations. Um, in one study, um, they found that conducting programs within community settings and utilizing existing community connections demonstrated enhanced social health outcomes and increased social capital that leveraged staff training in evidence-based practices that promote engagement and cooperation between different age groups. Um, and then in a report from Generations United, 92% of Americans actually believe that intergenerational communities can help reduce loneliness across all ages. Yet only about 26%, um, so about one quarter of the population, are aware of places in their community that connect care and services across generations already. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of examples because in the statistic I just talked about, about just the awareness of different programs or these age-friendly communities, I think it's important to highlight a couple that are actually happening. So in Jenks, Oklahoma, um, the Grace Living Center is actually co-located with Jenks Public Schools in um, West Elementary School. And so there's intergenerational learning um, is a part of the every day for the students in that school, as well as the older adults that live in the Grace Living Center. Uh, and children and residents of the living community actually engage in conversations, activity, and learning experience uh, experiences. And in this vibrant intergenerational community, both children and residents alike benefit from shared interactions that foster social connection and belonging. Um, in Rocky River, Ohio, um, libraries like the Rocky River, Ohio Public Library are often community hubs that can help um, play a role in building com community connection through intergenerational programming. An arts-based programming connects children and soon an intergenerational gaming program will pair younger adults with older adults for esports competitions and activities. So that's intergenerational communities. Um, and then we have shared spaces and green spaces. So this may include parks, sports and recreation fields, public school grounds, greenways and trails connecting different areas of a region. This is especially important in rural contexts because fewer built structures and more open land require an intentional focus on versatile and multi-solving spaces. For, for example, a school may also serve as a community center, an athletic facility, via open use agreements, maybe an event venue or an emergency, emergency shelter. Some of the notable benefits of these shared use spaces and green spaces include higher quality green spaces and landscape streets actually enhance social cohesion by fostering natural interactions among residents. And then other research in cities um, have found that the role of natural environments um, really encourage time spent outdoors and walkability um, have contributed to increased opportunities for social interaction and lower levels of perceived loneliness. Um, a couple of examples that I'd love to highlight for you are one um, in Normal, I, um, Illinois. 
So functioning primarily as a circle to address a challenging intersection, the circle serves as a public open space for community members with a park and a seating area, as well as an open plaza. It also includes a water feature where stormwater is cleansed, providing both aesthetic and sustainable solutions. The circle serves as a hub for community members um, where festivals are held, commuters can stop for lunch, and children and families can also play. In Cedar Rapids, Iowa, following a major flood, community members in Cedar Rapids um, actually partnered with the Project for Public Spaces organization to rebuild a major stretch of the downtown area through the creation of a new city market. So Nubo, which is the new city market, is open year round and offers residents access to an outdoor indoor market, community events and activities, a commercial kitchen, and a central meeting place for local vendors. And then I think it's important to talk about social prescribing. So through more research, um, the mo more research must be conducted on social pres prescribing and its effects. Um, preliminary research shows that promise there's a lot of promising effects of social prescribing on reducing loneliness and increasing social connection. So if you're not familiar with social prescribing, um, it is a practice that has been um, kind of throughout the UK for, for many, many years, as well as Canada. Um, Social Prescribing USA is kind of the US affiliate and is really trying to spread it um, into practitioner offices as well as medical schools. And we're working really closely with the VA to roll out a medical, um, a course for medical and nursing students about social prescribing. But if you're not familiar with the concept, it's when an individual goes to a doctor instead of getting a prescription for a, you know, a uh, a prescription drug, they're actually getting a prescription to join a club. So let's say, you know, I walk in and I say, you know, I'm experiencing really, I'm really sad. I'm feeling really lonely. Um, the doctor would actually help support a, a social prescription um, that would help get me into maybe it's say a swim club or to some other kind of activity um, instead of prescribing me Xanax or some other medication. Um, and I think, you know, social prescribing can also direct individuals to resources and teach them emotional skills to improve their mental and emotional health. Um, and it can also be a way of kind of improving cultural competency and of affirming care. So another strategy that relates to helping people access these spaces is expanding access to affordable public transportation. So we talked about earlier the access to public transportation or potentially the, the cost associated with accessing public transportation. So research has really highlighted its, its role in reducing isolation, improving social engagement, particularly for the rural and older adult populations who may face barriers to driving or lack alternative transportation means. So increased access to safe, reliable public transportation can improve opportunities for social connection and recreation, build social capital, and increase social ties. In St. John's County, Florida, um, there is a um, Sunshine Bus um, is the name of the program. Every time I say that out loud, it just like brings a big smile to my face. Um, so it was actually funded by the county's Council on Aging, and it provides nine routes for countywide navigation and connection to neighboring communities. It also provides door-to-door -door service for residents with mobility needs and welcomes all residents to use it, offering discounted fares for older adults, people with disabilities, and then Medicaid recipients and students. And a study done in rural Minnesota noted that the role of public transportation in reducing isolation for disadvantaged groups by really improving their access to necessary services and activities. So Angela, you mentioned, you know, only being able to have access to medical appointments, but what about needing to go grocery shopping or other services um, or activities? So we did talk a little bit about broadband access as well. So not all initiatives have to be in person. We can also leverage virtual spaces, but it needs to be recognized that the need for expanded broadband, broadband access and affordability. So internet access can actually help reduce loneliness and improve, improve well-being, especially among individuals who are, who are older, disabled, or live in rural areas, or have issues with transportation access, as we talked about. It can also increase um, the use of medical services and social amenities. So you can think about community centers, places of worship, and libraries offering broadband access and individuals actually coming into those spaces to access internet, but also bumping into their neighbors, right? 
So digital connectivity actually provides critical access to health services through telehealth options, along with civic engagement, employment, and social opportunities. So you can think about accessing a support group or social networking or virtual group spaces. In addition to physical and mental health benefits, patients who use telehealth services were also able to access greater, have greater rapport and social networks with their doctors. It also can increase our interaction with family, friends, and neighbors. Um, I mentioned that I, I spend all of my time, I live in Washington, D.C. with my partner. My whole social network or kind of family network is on the West Coast. And so having access to my phone and to Instagram and to my email to keep in contact with those individuals. And I'm specifically thinking of my grandma, who I mentioned earlier, um, her and I have a standing Sunday call before she goes to church. She always gives me a call. Um, and we get to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes as she's getting ready to leave. And I think without that, we wouldn't have like that close, that close relationship. So I'm really grateful for her having access to internet as well as me. Um, so for groups that have been historically um, marginalized or have faced higher rates of risk when associated with isolation and loneliness, the internet has actually provided an opportunity to connect with others anonymous, anonymously. And that can really help um, for older adults that are experiencing abuse. Maybe they're hesitant to, to ask for help, um, but they can do so in a forum um, and get that kind of that support that they need. It should also just be noted that the inter while the internet is great, it can also produce negative consequences like lower quality interaction or actually increased feelings of isolation. Um, so if, you know, if we have an older adult or someone who is, is a, seeing friends or family members actually engaging with one and one another with, you know, pictures on Facebook or Instagram, that can actually increase their experiences of, of loneliness or isolation. Um, a couple of highlights that I want to raise to the surface. So in San Jose, California, eligible low-income residents can actually participate in the city's affordable connectivity program, which provides a discount on their internet service or the one-time purchase of a computer or a tablet. So that's actually kind of a county-level, um, city-level initiative that they've put funding towards. The FCC Life Program offers resources, tools, and support to help address the gaps in access. And then we also um, work really closely with Never Tech Late, which is developing courses that help introduce older adults to the world of technology, FaceTime, Zoom, ride sharing, et cetera, and also teaches safe web access. So how to identify phishing scams and, pro and promote social connection and lifelong learning. Um, we also recommend facilitating cross-boundary collaboration partnerships and investments to help drive long-lasting systemic change. So this inclu includes cross-boundary partnerships. And what I mean by that is across county, city, and state lines. So really kind of the more um, local leaders that are at the table across different kind of um, boundaries is really important to help strengthen and kind of cover this, this space. Um, the benefits of these include um, partnership expanding on the on sharing of best practices, resources, and solutions to combat social isolation, and can really lead to the development of scalable and adaptable models that address the unique needs of diverse communities and leverage diverse perspectives to tackle multifaceted issues. Additionally, urban-rural partnerships can actually provide really invaluable insights to one another around how different environments influence social connectivity and how interventions can actually be tailored to suit different demographics and geographic contexts. Some examples that I'd, or an example that I'll highlight is in Ohio. So the USDA funded an extension program um, that are really effectively enhancing connection between rural and urban areas. And as part of the project, um, Ohio State University aimed at bridging urban and rural divides. The program has really explored economic flows, cultural diversity, and environmental challenges across the urban-rural continuum. And it's highlighting the dynamic interaction between urban and rural areas, emphasizing the need for comprehensive approaches to development, to develop, um, the, to develop and recognize complex relationships. And we're going to cover how to do that in, in just a moment. 
Um, we're about an hour into our experience, and I think it's important um, for us as adult learners to take a break. So I'm going to offer a 10 minute um, kind of intermission here for you to take care of your needs, maybe attend to some of the emails that have come in, but we will come back um, at seven after 10 if you're on the West Coast time. So we'll come back in 10 minutes.
We'll come back together in about two minutes. So finish up your bio break. And if you feel like rejoining on screen, I'd love to see your faces. Um, but go ahead and take just those last couple sips of coffee or refresh your cup and we'll come back together in just about a minute. Thanks for Kathy for joining us. All right. Um, I know I just blew through a lot of information about promising strategies and then the action guide we touched on a little bit or some promising strategies from the action guide and from our social framework reports. Um, I'm curious of the things that I've kind of shared in the last hour-ish, whether it was the trends or talking about promising strategies, what's resonating? Um, what are you curious about? Um just really kind of wanted to open some space up for, for questions or kind of aha moments, um, but we'll kind of hold space. So what's resonating so far? I think for me, just how it's, it's so embedded across the board, you know, there's, there's not one aspect of our lives that, it doesn't affect, uh, as Angela Franklin said earlier, you know, so many lives could be saved if we could get on top of the social isolation piece. Yeah. Thanks, Angela. Casey, or Ka sorry, I don't know why I keep wanting to call you Casey. Cassie, thanks for coming on screen. It's great to see your smiling face this morning. Um, what would you like to add? Yeah, well, coming on screen is like a big part of these Zoom meetings, right? I used to make myself do it during pandemic and now it's so easy to stay off screen, but it does foster more connection to do so. So thanks for encouraging it. Uh, I, you know, the prescribing social was really neat for me. I mean, that pres social prescribing, um, at, again, as like a volunteer organization, constantly trying to recruit new volunteers, new volunteers. We know once we can get an, a, an isolated older adult into our volunteer network that their lives are going to change. We're going to see them thrive. Uh, this foster grandparent has been doing work with us for 23 years. She's been a classroom grandma. She just celebrated her 90th birthday, and she had 84 people at her birthday party. 23 years of service. She is not isolated. She is not lonely. She gets hugs and loves from kids and teachers in school every day. So. There's like this gorgeous program model that, that works. It's nationwide. It's like the worst kept secret. Nobody knows about it. And it exists in almost, it exists in every single state across the nation, this foster grandparent program. So it's like, how do we do a better job of supporting and promoting some of these opportunities that are out there um, that do create that intergenerational dynamic. This particular program even comes with a financial stipend, so it removes so many barriers to service. And I think that social prescribing is a huge part of the answer. Um, as caseworkers and, and healthcare, community health workers, thinking beyond that next step. Okay, I got this person stable housing, I got this person food, and now they're gonna roll off my caseload, right? Yay, I did my job. And we have so much on our plates, but but what's the next step after that? Get, getting them that next level of sustainability, getting them engaged in in, in community. So it's we struggle with it. We've been, I've been the director of our organization for ten years, and I haven't connected with Old Clinica, and haven't connected with Road Community Health to to make those follow up. So more work around how we can do that, how we can get our aging and disability resource connection referral agencies are two one ones to think about the next step after those the immediate needs are met. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna like hold that story of what's her name, the 90 year old? Grandma Pat. Grandma Pat. I actually had a grandma Pat who showed up in my elementary school and taught us all how to crochet. 
Um, I doubt it's the same grandma, Pat, but I, it's like that energy of like really being there for her community and her community being there for her. It's incredible. Um, Michelle, I'm going to go ahead and just read yours aloud. Um, so great information across the board. It's very impactful to know that social isolation is so prevalent in all groups and inspiring that we are aware and working to improve engagement. Yeah. And then Regina said, I'd like to see more intergenerational opportunities and getting those Gen Z people together with older adults. Yes, 100%. Morgan, I'll, I'll jump in because it uh, that comment's reminding me of um, our executive director, Jillian Rakusen, was speaking with an organization called um, Cogenerate a few months ago about bringing together um, the generations and the, um, I'll put the link in the chat, uh, after this, but, um, it was really interesting how many people see solutioning for young adults and older adults separately. Um, they were talking about, for example, there's a youth AmeriCorps and then a senior AmeriCorps. And it's just like, well, let's just have them be one, one thing together and not, um, not have to to create these these boundaries um and so definitely all of the the solutions that people are coming up with for um bringing together two of the loneliest generations loneliest generations two of the um opposite spectrums of 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 life um are always really really great to hear thanks shannon this is my colleague shannon everybody she's fantastic um Thanks for putting that link in the chat, Shannon. Um, Farah said, in regards to the internet availability, I think a volunteer group to make home visits to assist older adults with tech struggles and training. Yes. And I know um, Amazon is not doing nearly enough, um, but they actually have a one of their, they have a, del, a doorbell program. So like the um, Amazon like camera, they're starting to to pilot that um, and giving older adults actually free access to those to help um, with like fall prevention. Um, so that's like another kind of tech piece that's kind of on the forefront. So I'm gonna move us along. Um, so this is one of my favorite slides, not just because of the beautiful graphic that you see on the screen, um, but also because it's about our action guide for building socially connected communities. So you heard me mention this, um, but this was a tool that we launched about a year ago. We have de we, de we spent a year developing it. So our work on the action guide really began in 2022 and was a result of community leaders saying, we know this is, we know isolation and loneliness is a problem. We do not know where to start. And so we created the action guide um, as a tool for local leaders, such as yourselves. We think of leaders as anyone um, in informal or formal leadership within a community, whether that's a librarian or an elected official or the head of a volunteer organization. Um, you all have kind of a, a role to play and kind of a you know, a way to, to really move this work along. And so our action guide for building socially connected communities or action guide for short is our way of providing tools to you all. And so the action guide is actually a six steps, six step process. Um, the first three steps are really about like learning and understanding local context. And so step one, um, we provide um, kind of a guide for, for doing a self-reflection or a reflection on your community. So what does community mean to you? What are the strengths and challenges? Who are the populations that are most at risk of isolation and loneliness in your community? Really kind of starting to kind of churn the understanding and reflecting on current state. Step two is about the drivers of disconnection. So some of the information that I presented today about the impacts of isolation and loneliness and disconnection, the drivers of, um, are within that step of the guide. We also have our community, our county level data dashboard, which I'll go into in just a second, that is made up of 15 indicators to really help you understand what is the current state um, from a data perspective in your community. And so that's a really good space, like kind of part. If you need to bring local leader, other local leaders or partners along with you to really understand and paint the picture of the impact of this issue, that's where I would kind of point you to is to be able to kind of take county level data and put that in front of folks. 
Um, step three is about collaborating. So we have our community listening session, um, which we provide a complete blueprint of from invitation all the way to facilitation. And that's really to help you identify community members um, that you want to work with. We have a partnership mapping exercise, which I'll talk about in just a second to help you start to identify partners, maybe the like kind of ones you would originally, you would kind of go to and gravitate towards naturally, but also those that might be outside of your direct line of kind of collaboration that could really have an impact on the implementation or the intervention that you just, you want to design for your community. And then the second kind of part of the guide is around planning and evaluating. And so we have um, in step four, a workshop template for you to bring all of your partners together to really kind of put on paper what your vision for this work is and to start to think about what are the goals that we want to accomplish and then how are we moving that to action. And then step five is around um, evaluating the impact of your initiative. Um, and that is kind of providing some, some really kind of thoughtful questions, but also some tangible tools on data collection planning, and then also measurement and stakeholder engagement to really drive um, kind of improvement of the intervention that you choose, that you kind of put into action, but also um, kind of thoughtful feedback on like, is this really getting towards what we're, what we're trying to achieve? And then the last kind of part of the action guide is about sharing. So Cassie mentioned that there's this great program and it's like the worst kept secret. And one of the things that we're really invested in as an organization is highlighting bright spots and making sure that communities from across the country can see kind of examples of work that's being done and then thinking about how they might adapt that in their context. I think one of the things we we do in the community development space a lot is reinventing the wheel when there's kind of a program or a practice that we could actually adapt and bring into our context, honoring like the lived experience, obviously, of the, the community members that we're, we're trying to be of service to, um, but really not trying to reinvent the wheel. So that's our our action guide. And I like to mention that um, this graphic that you see on your screen was actually um, inspired by a park that was right next to the college that I went to um, in Seattle. And so I love that this was before my time at the foundation, but this is, this is like a really good reminder of like something that I have as a memory of a place that I would go to study or to spend time with friends. And there was a farmer's market and it was a very vibrant kind of community space. So I mentioned our data dashboard. So we have um, 15 indicators. This sits in our um, step two of our action guide. Um, the indicators are broken into three levels. Um, the first is the individual indicator level. So this is concepts related to social connection or disconnection of an individual. One of our indicators in this section is the percentage of people in that county that are actually living alone. Um, we know that living alone is um, not necessarily correlated with someone being isolated or experiencing loneliness, um, but it's kind of an important um, percentage to look at. Um, Washington, D.C., for instance, was quoted as one of the loneliest cities in America. Um, and that was based on the, the amount of people that are actually living alone. So the percentage of the population that are living alone. I would argue that, yes, there's a lot of people experiencing loneliness in Washington, D.C., but I would not necessarily say that the percentage of folks that live alone are, is the people, is the percentage the same as the percentage of people experiencing loneliness. Um, we also have our priority population. So we have the percentage of people who live below the poverty line, 65 year old and plus people living with multiple chronic conditions, isolated seniors, and people that are living um, in mental distress. So a really good place, again, to come to kind of be able to pull your priority populations, think about who might be impacted the most by this issue and who might we want to design for. And then we have our community level social engagement indicators. So that's concepts related to social engagement um, at the community level, like the percentage of volunteering, civic engagement and participation in community groups. 
And then we have our broader policy and system and environmental indicators. So this is concepts related to the influence of environment systems and policies determined by government and organizations. So this is percentage of, of access to, to broadband, to parks, um, and to other community spaces. Um, I think that it's also kind of really helpful. So on your screen, you see um, an indicator related to social associations and we actually provide a benchmark of the county that we're looking at um, to the national and also to the state. So you can see the little um, indicator is red. So that actually means that this county, and I can't remember exactly which one this is off the top of my head, is actually slightly worse or slightly lower than the national average. So you can kind of start to think about not just what this number is, but also how that ties to the national and the state. Um, for each indicator, um, we provide a definition. So to write directly to the right, you see the definition of the social association um, and then how it relates to social connection or social isolation and loneliness. I mentioned the benchmarking of the color. And then we also have a deepening your understanding section in the data dashboard. So this is tips and references to dig deeper. Um, and also like for, for example, um, we include complementary local data or additional considerations for specific populations. And this resource can really help provide further contextualization by looking at other factors in your community. Um, I was going to share my screen. Um, I would love for someone to share what county they are calling in from. And I was gonna go ahead and pull it up on our data dashboard so we can take a look at it together. And I'm just gonna call on someone. Uh, Barry, I really like the look of your hat in your picture. What county are you calling in from? Uh, Coos County. Coos County, okay. Sorry to call you out on the spot. That's fine. How do you spell coos? C O O S. Awesome. Okay. So now we have our data dashboard up for Coos County. Um, so we see kind of this individual indicators of social connectedness, um, kind of the individual section. So we have the percentage of folks that are living alone. So that's slightly higher than the national benchmark of 28.3. So it sits at about 31.31%. Um, and you can see that like a low percentage um, is more supportive of social connection, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's there's lower rates or higher rates of loneliness. Um, and we can see living alone may increase the risk of social isolation and loneliness, particularly for older adults and those with mobility challenges. Um, Oregon is actually the ones, one of the states that we do not have BFSS data for. So for, I think it's 40 or 38 states, we have BFFS data for lacking social and emotional support and then feeling socially isolated. We're hoping to have um, data for Oregon shortly. Um, and then you see our priority, the priority population. So we have percentage of those living below the poverty line, population of those with um, any disability. So you can kind of start to pull. These are the the these represent the at risk um, populations that I mentioned on one of my previous slides. Percentage of veterans, foreign born. And then we have our community social engagement indicator. So voting participation. So this is actually fairly high, so 72.2%, um, but it's slightly lower than the state average. Volunteering, social associations, um, and then we have our policy systems and environmental indicators. So residential segregation, black and white, school segregation, residential mobility, culture and arts entertainment institutions. So um, this is the, the number of cultural arts and entertainment institutions within this county. Um, parks, libraries, computer and internet access, transit services. Barry, not to call you out again, but are any of these kind of these data, the indicators surprising to you or are any of them standing out? Actually, I've only moved here since... Um... October 25th 
so I, I'm actually new to the state and I'm new to the area. So I don't really, I can't actually give you a good reflection of the data or the information. So anything's actually new to me. Wow. So, so that's uh, a good perspective to have. And also congratulations and or welcome to Coos County. Thank you. So I, I, I so I, I really don't have, I'm very, um, I, I guess, apathetic in a way. Yeah. Um, so everything's kind of a cultural shock to me in a way to anything that I obtain um, when it comes to my demographics and my subgroups here. Mm. So um, I don't really have um, everything is um, new data for me as I continue to work with my populations here. Amazing. Well, I'd love to check back with you maybe in a year once you're settled and you can tell me if these feel like they're in line with what you're experiencing and what you're hearing, or maybe if there's some like discrepancies. Um, yes. So everything, so everything is I work with, you know, clinically or, you know, ma from the meso and macro level of working populations is all new. I just don't, um, huh. I'm just, everything, I, everything I gather right now is just new. It's new information for me. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I think that that's a really valuable perspective to come in and have kind of not an outsider, but like a fresh perspective, right? Because everything's new. You're kind of taking it all in. Yes. Awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up um, Curry County so we can take a look at that together. Um, but yeah, the, we've just, you know, numbers we know do not tell the whole story. Um, but I do think it's just kind of interesting to start looking at and thinking about like, what are these indicators that may or may not kind of support the picture that we're seeing and, or like, how does it enable us to start looking at what type of interventions we might want to be planning for and for whom we might be planning for. So Michelle, um, I, I put Curry County on here um, and I'm just going to kind of scroll through and kind of name a couple of things. And if, you know, you want to come off of mute and give some kind of color to what we're seeing. Happy, happy to have you come off of mute. So living alone, 26.5%. So that's slightly uh, lower than the state average of 28%. Again, the these two indicators are missing for our friends in Oregon. We have our priority population percentages. So 34.4% of the population is age 65 plus. Sixty-five percent of Medicare beneficiaries age 65 or plus have two or more chronic diseases. 18.8% of seniors live alone. Yeah, so I would really just encourage, if this is helpful, um, we really wanted to kind of bring all of these different data points together in one place for community leaders. Um, you know, I think ultimately we'd love to see kind of some of these numbers shift as more people start to do work, the work of social connection. But we also know that these are just indicators and that they're going to take a long time to kind of move. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and switch back to the presentation. Um, so one of the other tools that I mentioned or kind of aspects, um, exercises within the action guide is our partnership mapping um, tool. And so this is actually inspired by the Saskatchewan Nation Um and so with the knowledge gained from the dashboard, you can really move into thinking about collaboration and completing our partnership mapping exercise and learning how to host a community listening session can be really helpful as like a starting point for this work. Um, so you all are here with us today because you're kind of interested and passionate about some aspect of this work. And I think to kind of build the case and to kind of really see who comes to the table, completing the partnership mapping exercise and doing the community listening session is a really good kind of next step. Um, but in our kind of partnership mapping exercise, we talk about three different categories of partners. So who can help you understand the topic area or the issue? who can help you with outreach, and then who can help you actually advance social connection initiatives. And this really helps like unearth um, kind of partners that you've maybe thought about and been in contact with, but also folks that might not be on your radar. 
and I mentioned this at the, the beginning, but we really see like the most interesting and like the highest kind of impact happen when there's really diverse coalitions of partners at the table. So I'm thinking about some friends of ours in South New Jersey, um, where there was a, the backbone organization was a nonprofit hospice care provider. Um, and they brought kind of folks from health and human services and the local Y and all of these different organizations from across the kind of this area of New Jersey together for a community listening session. And out of that, they've actually formed um, a working group and are starting to do some work together. And then one of the representatives from HHS has now advocated for a budget line for groups from across New Jersey to actually do start to do some work around older adults and isolation. So really kind of interesting collaborations that are kind of unfolding in South Jersey. And that also is true for a couple different states. I just talked to a group in Wisconsin that's having some really interesting collaboration across sectors. It just really helps kind of move the work along and it kind of takes the onus off one individual or one organization for driving the work. So planning your social connection initiative. So in this step, you'll you convene a coalition of partners to host a social connection workshop. There's a there's a difference between the community listening session and the workshop. The community listening session is a really about like understanding context and bringing people to the table to really build kind of the, the why of the work. And then the social connection workshop or maybe a series of workshop is how do you translate ideas into action? So um, the first step of this is to build a coalition or a collaboration. Um, you, we have an invitation template and a preparation list, a sample agenda for either an hour, half an hour, a half day or a full day session. Um, and then kind of what comes out of your social connection workshop is a social connection plan. And I'm using the word social connection a lot, I realize. Um, so that's kind of drafting a vision statement, establishing clear goals, creating an actionable plan and establishing roles and responsibilities, and also creating a post-workshop plan. So what are your next steps? Um the evaluate step that I mentioned is all about tracking and measuring change um, to really determine if your initiative is achieving intended outcomes and identifying areas for opportunity. So collecting data can also be used to report your progress to partners and the broader community and really building support to expand your initiative and help other communities implement an, an, an initiative similar to yours potentially in the future. So this step includes data collection planning, strategies for engaging stakeholders, recommendations for measurement tools. Um, because we have this kind of grounding in um, research and, and kind of science, we have a lot of different measurement tools. We have a um, measurement inventory that's really helpful to start thinking about, okay, what are measures that can be used for specific populations, segments, for specific interventions? Um, we also have resources to learn more about social connection measurement tools. Um, it also features our case study on front porch community services. Um, so a little bit of background here, the Coalition for Social Connection in Northern California was actually founded by a group of researchers and local community organizations to address social isolation, loneliness, and social connection. I'm actually speaking with one of the, the founders of this at a conference tomorrow, so really excited to see her. Um, and the intent of this coalition was to really strengthen best practices and social connection programming with a particular lens towards evaluation. So social call, a front porch community service, fostering the development of intergenerational friendships via phone or video was a founding member of the coalition. Along, and alongside with Dr. Carla Parisonoto and her research team at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, so this is just kind of an example that's within the guide of kind of uh, an example of how um, an initiative was measured, what they used, what they thought about, who were the partners at the table to help with the, the implementation of the measurement, et cetera. Um, and so then the last step of the guide I mentioned is all about sharing. So this is communicating and publicizing what you have accomplished with partners, community members, government officials, funders, and other stakeholders 
we really think it's important to educate others and bring them along in the journey that is the work that you're doing to build support um, and potentially bring additional funding to continue your important social connection work. You can also use these conversations to gather feedback and ideas for the next steps in your initiative and thereby raising support for your work, establishing new partnerships and potentially securing funding. Um, and all these actions can help sustain and expand your impact. Um, to further help um, kind of with implementation, um, we also have a case studies um, part of the guide. This is an example of one of the case studies. Um, the group that we highlight here is the Motion Pictures and Television Fund and the LA County Social Isolation Impact Coalition. Um, and so this is just another example of one of the case studies. Okay, I have done a lot of talking. Um, I would love to open the space for some questions. Um, I have my colleagues Shannon and Blake with me, um, but I would love for you to ask questions of each other as well. Um, but I will kind of leave the, the floor open for some questions. Morgan, this is Angela Jensen. I see in the chat that we have a lot of interest in those county stats. Um, incredible that you all were able to pull all of that together and incredibly valuable. I think all of our OABHI specialists across the state need to look at their specific counties and follow this roadmap as well. So. I'm sorry if I missed it, if you said it previously, where did all the data come from again? Who, where are you pulling from? CDC? Um... Yes. Um, so it's various sources. CDC is definitely one of the, the primary. Um, one of the things, you guys can see the, the data dashboard again, correct? On my screen? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so Next to each of the indicators, there's a little icon that's the that's an, a little I, and it actually will show you the source, the actual source of the data. So you can see that this living alone statistic actually came from the American Community Survey. And so you can take, you can click that and it will go take you right toward to the Census Bureau and show you kind of the background on the survey. And then it also will show the different data releases. One of the things that we don't have right now that we're considering in future iterations of the data dashboard is looking across years. And so you can see here for the living alone, we have the 2022 data set and we also have the 2023 data set. Um, and so as more years are added, well, we are considering having like a multi-year view. So you can kind of look across different years to see how it shifts. That would uh, be fantastic. I know we have a, a long wish list of Ida of, of things. Um, one of our other kind of big ambitions is actually to have a two way data repository. And what I mean by that is to have data represented in the way that you see it here, but also have the capability of local leaders uploading data, uh, like local data sets being able to de-identify it and then kind of have it available for others from across the county or from across the country to look at. Because one of the things that we're missing right now is while it's great that we have indicators, we're not seeing necessarily the like the hyper-local level um, or the ability to kind of separate counties into like census tracts or into specific zip codes. Because I think one thing that we know is there's a there can be a lot of different stories and a lot of different context at a county level, right? Yes. So the county that I grew up in, there's a particularly affluent area of it, and then there's a particularly non-affluent area of it, but they're all in the same county. And so it makes it, it kind of warps the picture a little bit. Right, right. We found that too in looking for data. We've had people ask me, can you, can you pull up this data for this neighborhood? It's like, no, sorry. Yeah, uh, please and, keep uh, advocating for that. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. Um, and then we also, um, you know, the the data company that we are working with to host the data dashboard right now, we have the ability to do custom reports, but it's pretty costly. 
And so what we're trying to figure out is like, how do we democratize the access to that? Because to your point, Angela, there's a lot of like, we, we want to be able to like give people like for you to be able to type in your zip code and for or to make custom polls with multiple zip codes or multiple census tracts to just get your specific picture. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. And this is all, I, I think I said this at the beginning, but the action guide is completely, it's a completely free resource available to anyone. We highly encourage the exploration of it. Um, we recently added this search bar. So if there's specific things that you are interested in um, for my presentation today and my colleague Shannon um, just dropped the action guide link in the chat again. Um, but I highly encourage you to kind of explore and use kind of what is of service. Other questions or comments? Okay. Well, we will have some QR codes where you can keep uh, in contact with us. And I welcome conversations via email or kind of live calls as well. However, we can be helpful. Um, but I'd like to kind of close this out today with uh, this reflection question. So what's one thing that you're taking away from today? Um, I'm curious about maybe it's a statistic, maybe it's um, an aha moment, maybe it's something that you want to learn more about. Um, but what are, what's a thing or a couple of things that you're taking away from today's conversation? Hello, can you hear me? We can. Thanks for coming off the of mute, Sabria. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm from Jackson County and I was curious to see our local trends and data um, for the area. And I noticed that, um, School segregation is higher than the state benchmark, but residential segregation is quite worse than the um, state benchmark. So I think that what stood out to me was like um, <laughs> how important school is in creating social connections for children, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And we, um, our social framework report on the, on education, I would, if you're curious about exploring that more. Um, we have a really great report on the education sector and I think Shannon is looking for that link and is gonna drop it in the chat. Um, but I, two months ago was in Iowa at a teacher's conference and we doing kind of a presentation on social connection and, and the classroom. Um, and I think we also, like we forget that um, it's not just about like the students' sense of belonging, but it's also mm -hmm. about the family's sense of belonging um, in the community. And then also teachers are like a huge kind of like the workplace. So there's a lot of different kind of lenses of social connection as well beyond the like, I think most important, which is like the student to student learning how to interact with one another, SEL skills, all of those things. Right. I think that also calls for a need for schools to have opportunities for, you know, parents to come to school and, you know, interact with the kids or other parents. Yeah. And that are not during the work day, because I right. think there's like opportunities to kind of volunteer in your child's classroom. But that's really kind of a place of like privilege and like opportunity for those that are not working a nine to five or are, you know, not working multiple jobs. So like, how are you providing additional opportunities for parents to engage? Very true, very true. Um, Cassie, I'm gonna go ahead and read yours um, off that you put in the chat. Um, agree with Angela, social prescribing is new to me and I love it. I'm going to take this on as a personal advocacy project. Amazing. And we will follow up. There is a short documentary and I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was made in the UK about social prescribing. Um, that would be really interesting for you to watch just to kind of get like a concept of how, how they're thinking about it. Um, one of the things that I will just note is like social prescribing has not taken, I think as much of a route in the U S yet, because there's the medical side. So like making sure that doctors are prepared and understand how to do social prescribing and see it as important. And then there's also the kind of, um, 
there's like the demand side and then like the resource side. So like how, making sure that there are resources and that like there's clubs and organizations available to be prescribed to and that those clubs and organizations can then refer out to other clubs and organizations if it's not like the best fit. Um, Anna Rodriguez, I learned that youth also experience loneliness and it's not just the older population. Yes. And we're actually working with a partner right now to expand access to clubs and organizations for Gen Z that's specifically living in Atlanta, New York, and LA, three very transient urban areas where Gen Z is actually experiencing really high rates of loneliness. So even in an urban environment, right? Not necessarily know where to go or how to connect with others. So um, I worked in a different part of the country um, close to you as well, DMV area, Appalachian area. And I think there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Um, in many cases, we get, we, I was the director of behavioral, senior behavioral health uh, for over 15 years. And when individuals had UTIs, uh, early signs of dementia, uh, Parkinson's and others, and where a lot of our seniors and elderly were abandoned. And so they would go into senior behavioral health with, um, you know, sundowning, um, all early signs of dementia as well. And the biggest fear of them being worried about is being placed, well, as being an ALF or SNF and losing their independence, worrying about their functioning and worrying about their ADLs. And so the biggest fear is, is worrying about their finding out about their loneliness, or finding out they're being alone. Yeah. And that was the biggest issue is losing their independence and losing, losing their home and losing and losing what they had for the biggest time. And the prescription or identif identification of finding out that they were alone. So sometimes it's not always the biggest identity of finding about their loneliness because they lost what they've had for 70 to 80 years. And whether they lost their husband or lost their children or lost everything else and their family is abandoning them. So sometimes the identity or the identification of finding out that they were alone and losing their social circles or their support system sometimes comes out. This might be the final identity of finding out they lost their independence as well. And in, at that time, when we were working with a, uh, a geriatrician or a psychiatrist or a social worker or a counselor, um, it becomes very daunting and intimidating because that's not something they've worked with in the past 50 to 60 years. Shannon, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's a really good point. And um, uh, one of our working groups um, from our advocacy organization that's now coming over to the foundation um, that's focused on older adults um, has also vocalized that experience of of um, of how that happens among the older adult population. And I think that um, it. I mean, it, it goes back to to our conversation in the beginning about the the difference of of social isolation and loneliness, and also um, a issue that they're coming up with with evaluation is that it's so hard to accurately understand this issue among this population because of the way you have to word questionnaires and surveys because nobody wants to admit that they are experiencing that I think one of the first comments in our in our chats was how um where was it um quite funny but um something about oh yeah I'm not that old yet from an 80 year old like people don't want to admit about th there's so much stigma associated with this experience that um it's often quite hard to to intervene on 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 people who may not be aware or may not want to admit um, to these experiences. Yeah. The biggest fear is, is that we're all mandated reporters and, you know, yeah. we're, we're coming with, inter you know, as you said, we're coming with screenings or we, we, next thing we know, we're doing an assessment mm -hmm. and, you know, we're coming to that next level of care or intervening for, you know, to make sure they're okay for safety. And um, it gets very scary for not only for them, but for us as well, because we, we have a heart and we care for their next level of care if necessary. Um, loneliness 
can be the next level of worrying about are they are they eating are they are are they are they malnutritious are they are they able to uh, is their gait steady um is everything else okay and um you're building that rapport with them at the same time um and there is a generational gap at times there's other things as well and you want to make sure they're safe and you make sure they're healthy and they make sure they're seeing a PCP or geriatrician or everything else and um this is our greatest generations um and we just want to make sure they're they're cared for and um it's a very fragile situation every time uh when you want to make sure that it's just not only just an emotional behavioral issue um there might be something more to it at times and so I think very I really appreciate that perspective and sounds like you're bringing a lot of wisdom from where you were to where you are now and so I'm really grateful that you're bringing that kind of context and content with you um and I think it's you know we are really I I think that the the pandemic also like brought us along in all of our understanding of these issue areas but what we're also seeing is the same thing that's been that's been true about mental health, like stigmatization, as Shannon was kind of speaking to, and also kind of this like knee jerk reaction of the systems to address it. That's not kind of like taking a step back to really understand like the context and how moving into one kind of intervention right away for the individual can actually have a cascading effect that's not necessarily positive. So just appreciate that you're kind of like bringing that to the front of the conversation, Barry. Any other kind of ahas, reflections, kind of thoughts? Awesome, okay. It has been an absolute pleasure to spend the last, I really didn't think we were going to go for two hours, but we have made it to that two hour mark almost kind of exactly. Um, before we kind of separate and kind of say goodbye, I wanted to provide just a couple next steps and resources. Um, so you'll see four QR codes on your screen. Um, the first is our action guide for building socially connected communities, which Shannon has very graciously put in the chat a few times. The second is um, to stay connected with us. Um, we are having our conference, our annual conference next October um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we welcome you to join us there. Um, so that's to, to stay connected and to learn more about the conference. The third QR code, um, so the second to the right, is our built environment report that we just came out with this year. And again, that's about housing, transportation, and the built environment. Um, and then our last link, uh, the last QR code is to join our mailing list. So we are constantly sharing resources and best practices and all of the things. Um, so our, our mailing list is really the best way to stay um, kind of up to date and in contact with us. And then as always, if there's additional questions or comments or areas of support or kind of curiosities, please feel free to reach out to us at info at socialconnection.org. Um, and that's info at social-connection.org. Um, and we would love to hear from you about the work that you're doing, how we might be supportive, and or if there's areas for collaboration. Um, so please keep in contact with us. And I think with that, I'm going to hand it back to one of the Angelas. Awesome. Well, thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Shannon, for the great uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, so we will be sending follow-up email with uh, the presentation and any other links uh, that folks are wanting. And uh, look forward to uh, next year when we resume our uh, GERO competency series. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks folks. And we'll give you a little bit of time uh, before you, the next thing you have to do today. So have a good day. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.